Our next speaker is uh, decades of IETF experience. He currently works at ARM. Um, and I must add, he was also of by ARM in Embed TLS, which I think we all uh, appreciate a lot. Um, and with that, go ahead, uh, Hannes. Thank, thank you, Michael. I hope you guys can hear me well. Uh, and hopefully see me as well. Greetings yes. to those in the room and also to the people online. Is the audio okay? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, cool. Perfect. So, um, yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, to, to give me a chance to talk about uh, IoT security, specifically with ARM-based processors, which obviously an area I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with. Uh, there's obviously in general a possibility to talk about hardware-based security or the influence of hardware on IoT security. Oops. What you've seen in, in the presentation so far uh, was mostly a discussion about the use of, of Riot and, and related uh, uh, systems on processors that follow into the ARM v6M or ARM v7M. Uh, this is what you see on the left-hand side of the, of the diagram. The very low-end devices are sort of the, the V6M, sort of our M-class series, um, which M uh, is for embedded. In. And many, many of you are familiar with the hardware, like M, M3, M4, possibly also M7. So there's a, I think there's a good support in Riot for, for those type of uh, MCUs. Um, already in 2015, we've announced uh, the V8M architecture providing more software isolation. Um, and of course, back then it was a, a technology announcement. So that means that like you can read the documents, but uh, that's about it. Uh, but now like we are a few, year, few years later and now those devices are widely available, but uh, Riot support is a little bit lacking. So um, we'll also sort of in, at the beginning talk a little bit about what does that mean from a software point of view, and then switch over to even newer architecture releases, the V8.1M uh, architecture and what security features those provide. So Trust Zone, which was added on to the M-Class world, uh, was inspired by the A-Class environment, which you see on the left-hand side. And in and many of you are familiar with the A class processor or the application class processors uh, in context of the Raspberry Pi. And while it's not a primary focus for for Riot itself, um, it's still a, a like for us uh, a good inspiration of uh, security features that we can then move over to the M class world, as you will later actually see in in, in more detail. Um, but what does it mean from a software point of view? And that's what the block diagram on the right-hand side uh, should show you is there you essentially have um, sort of your regular uh, environment with let's say the uh, a Riot OS and then applications running on top of Riot OS uh, in what is referred to as the non-secure processing environment or in the past we used uh, the, word, the name uh, normal world. Um, but then there's some extra software needed uh, that actually runs the, the security functionality isolated in, in, in the secure processing environment. And that's an area uh, where one could think about like how would Riot uh, sort of provide that sort of software environment or software architecture. What we've done is we created the reference implementation, which we call Trusted Firmware M, uh, also borrowed from the A-class world, which had the name Trusted Firmware A um, for A-class. And there are security services running on top of it. And so what does that actually mean? Um, let's dig a little bit deeper and see um, how this practically looks like in our reference implementation. Uh, the grayed out area is sort of like the regular stuff, are those middleware applications. And the big um, sort of block in the middle 
or on the on the right hand side, this, the secure processing environment has a sort of a lower layer, which uh, is responsible for setting up the services for building, creating the runtime environment and also for routing requests that come over from the non-secure uh, environment. And the entry point, as, as indicated with uh, the red box, and maybe I can even um, use the pen to show something. Or well, maybe you see my mouse pointer. So the PSA functional APIs are, are the way to execute the services that are provided in these, uh, in these boxes. And just to name a few, which uh, we specified and which we implemented uh, in, in DFM, in Trusted Firmware M, you find things like um, storage services, uh, firmware update services, uh, crypto services, of course, uh, attestation services. And of course, uh, other services may be, may be added it on a, like without any sort of big hassle, just uh, you can just add them uh, along. But that's, um, that's sort of what, what we have done. If you think about how could Riot, the Riot OS do it, they're obviously extremes. Uh, one is you just reuse um, DFM in an, uh, on such a B8M architecture, or you could, um, on the other extreme, um, design something from scratch and think about like, how would you uh, utilize these, um, these software uh, or new software uh, compartmentalization uh, technology. Uh, and of course, there's also, there also a middle ground where you, um, for example, reuse the services and the APIs, but then the, the lower part, this, um, what is referred to as the core uh, or even secure boot uh, would be replaced by some riot specific uh, technology. So it's something more for food for thought. I'm not suggesting to go one way or the other, but I think going forward, there's more and more um, devices come out uh, supporting Trust Zone, uh, or also developers uh, wanting to use that form of uh, isolation. It would be good to have a story. And uh, having better security protection on the device is obviously beneficial for IoT devices, needless to say. OK. Um, so that was uh, already, like, as I said, uh, years ago when we introduced uh, the V8M architecture. But of course, writing the software is an ongoing process. So that took us a little bit of, uh, little bit of time. There's uh, very good support now for the, the chips that are out there, which um, are called M33, M23, and then the uh, hardened version, uh, so-called M35B. What is new, uh, and this is uh, what I wanted to highlight, is um, a new version of the of the uh, 8v8m architecture called uh, 8.1, and it comes with a couple of uh, additional features. And I would pick uh, specifically or highlight the security functionality. But there's lots lots of other features which um, are also interesting. Uh, but there's no time to talk about them. Specifically, the extensions for machine learning. Uh, these are uh, the so-called Helium extensions, similar to um, what you may be familiar with on, on A-class processes uh, called NEON extensions, uh, which are mostly single instruction multiple data uh, operations, so quite powerful operations. And these processes are called Cortex-M85 and 55. So how, how do they differ in terms of uh, security features? And this uh, table plots not just the, the new versions, but also puts them in context with the previous versions. And there are um, two things to point out. Um, the first one is that all the, the V8 architecture models have um, more MPUs, more memory protection units, uh, which is um, in addition to trust zone, another mechanism to isolate code and to protect uh, uh, libraries. Uh, from access from other libraries, um, whether that's an accidental access, uh, kind of a safety feature or, or security feature is a separate story. So having more MPU regions uh, makes it easier to, to write the software and to co configure your system. So you see like 16 uh, is a good number to actually work on your IoT device. 
And there are also um, some new uh, security features, which I, I will very briefly um, talk you through. Uh, the unprivileged debug extension, the privileged execute never attribute, and uh, what is called pointer authentication code and branch target identification. Uh, new features in, uh, that were introduced um, with the uh, 8.1 version. Um, yesterday, we heard uh, that um, one desirable feature is firmware encryption, and that protects against attackers that are um, that want to see the plain text firmware and specifically are interested in, in reverse engineering. Uh, and that's a, that's a great thing. Um, however, if you additionally want to protect your firmware against uh, not just an attacker and sort of like a, a random attacker, someone man in the middle or someone who can access your device, but also someone who actually writes software that can be because you are um, concerned about exposing security information on the device, or um, maybe you have machine learning code and you don't want to reveal the machine learning algorithms, then having a way to restrict debug um, only to the sort of application specific code or the unprivileged uh, code is what this feature uh, provides. And uh, that may be uh, a useful addition in some environments. Um, the privilege execute never is a way to allow more fine-grained control over memory uh, access. And so normally if you use, you configure your um, uh, MPU, you define permissions um, for those memory regions. And now you can also um, restrict um, the, and a privileged uh, handler to access uh, specific code. So in this, the diagram on the right, um, which is a little bit loaded, um, ensures uh, that the on the non-secure side. So if you are, if you recall the ARM architecture in with Trust Zone, it not only has this, it has this non-secure and secure environment, but it also has um, a handler mode and a, and a thread mode. So the handler uh, mode is typically used for very low-level uh, software whereas the thread mode is um, used for the applications and so on. And so typically you want to have um, the unprivileged thread mode to just access the, uh, make the calls into your security functionality, of course, at the expected entry point, and then invoke a crypto functions and then return back. Um, so you can forbid, for example, uh, certain uh, code regions to access those security functions as well, providing you sort of an extra level of um, sort of um, configuration and granularity. In general, like uh, setting these attributes for memory regions, whether that's a stack or whether that's uh, other regions where you are not expecting to execute code is obviously a, a good idea. Um, needless to say, it requires some configuration overhead. Well, some expertise in configuring uh, your device properly. Um, the, the pointer authentication and the branch target identifications have been introduced in the A-class architecture to deal with uh, return-oriented programming and also with uh, jump-oriented programming, which is very similar to return-oriented program programming. In, in both cases, um, you have an attacker who tries to find code snippets that um, typically uh, end with, a, in case of return-oriented program, with a, uh, a return call. So something a small, a small assembler fragment somewhere in your code that can be then reused to jump there and then return back. And in case of uh, jump-oriented programming, it, it uses indirect branches rather than return instructions. So those two were uh, features that were conceptually uh, the same as in, in the A-class architecture, but implementation-wise, they are st still quite different because the, the underlying architecture is different. Um, so let me uh, quickly introduce both of those to you because they are uh, fairly new in the, in the sort of M-class low-end IoT world. Um, here you see a sort of a snippet of how the pointer authentication code or PAC works. Um, and what it does is it um, there's a new instruction being added, or actually two. Um, 
the back, uh, which generates this point authentication code, which is, um, as you can see here in the box, it's, it's generated out of a cryptographic function, um, uses a key and then uh, some context information to produce this, uh, this point authentication code and then stores it in a, in a general purpose register. That's what, it, uh, what this part does. So the compiler or tools are, need to be updated to add support for this, um, ideally automatically when it, the, code is, um, the code has been instrumented accordingly um, by the developer and then uh, that gets added by the uh, compiler. And then in the end, of course, uh, once the, the function um, sort of is supposed to, to jump back, you need to verify whether anything or an attacker has managed to change anything. And that's where the, the pointer information is, is used to verify whether there are some, some changes. And then if some changes were detected, um, you expect the, uh, an, ex an exception to be triggered. And so this, this uses um, as, a, as a cryptographic mechanism, by default uses um, an algorithm, a cryptographic uh, block, uh, um, and a block uh, encryption function, uh, which is called QArmor. This is a Qualcomm ARM authenticator, uh, but one can also use something else. Uh, but we have uh, successfully used it for memory encryption in a class processors, so it's uh, lightning fast. Uh, there have been some um, attacks against this scheme on the a class processors uh, recently uh, published uh, by some, some folks at MIT. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, these attacks don't work on on the M class uh, because they use the translation or they use a side channel through the translation translation look aside buffer, which uh, an M class device doesn't have. Um, the branch target identification adds uh, another instruction to allow you to define a landing pad for uh, function calls in, in case of indirect branches. So this is the another code snippet that shows how this works. So Imagine um, you, you have a function, the address of the function, in this case, function B uh, in, in R1, in register R1, and you, you load that uh, into R0, and then you make a branch uh, to that function. And so the first instruction that is expected there is this PTI instruction. Um, and so uh, that's that's sort of like, so you can't easily jump into some other uh, environment like you would see here in, uh, in, in the bottom part. So here there's some attacker corrupting memory and he's trying to use um, the fact that this add instruction is very close to the, uh, the return instruction. So he would be using that um, as a snippet um, in, in a chain of, uh, um, commands to execute, um, to gain a certain advantage. And so that's sort of bypass because a jump into the add instruction um, without having the PTI idea would be, uh, would cause an, an exception as, as shown here. And um, by the way, at the end of the slides, I have details and pointers on um, to the material that I'm, I'm presenting here. So you can, there are obviously lots of details, but uh, I hope you, you get the high level ideas of what is um, being introduced here. Um, as, as Goran mentioned, there's obviously a wide range of IoT devices, uh, the M-class devices, even though they are getting uh, better and better in terms of features and, and also have accelerators with, for example, for machine learning. Um, there's still some devices that need uh, more capabilities and uh, Obviously, we shouldn't forget those, and I think they're also interesting for Riot. And here's uh, a system which we call CoreStone. It's a system on chip, and this diagram um, shows at the at the top shows the software stack, and at the bottom um, the hardware uh, sort of layout of the system on chip. And it basically comes with um, combination of Cortex A and Cortex M microcontrollers. So obviously, the Cortex A uh, processors provide you with the performance uh, and also with a system or with an environment that is uh, familiar to many developers uh, because it, it runs Linux. And uh, uh, so it's very convenient. 
Um, and the M-class processor, which is um, here acts as, a, uh, as an enclave, a secure enclave, and provides the security services. And if we go up to the software stack, um, it uh, may look familiar, namely to the slides that I had shown at the beginning of the talk. It uses um, the trusted firmware M, it uses MCU boot, and, and also has the secure services. So have, we have reused the software architecture and uh, that we developed for these M-class processors and put it into in this system on chip uh, to provide those security, security services. But in this case, um, offered to an A-class processors, uh, A-class processor, which looks like the um, like a classical uh, embedded Linux setup. There may be other M-class processors, like for example, for real-time motor control, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, and those could of course also run Riot, uh, but it's imaginable to, again here, to run uh, Riot actually in multiple different combinations um, uh, for the enclave and, and for the expansion system and so on in, in, a, in a bigger, more powerful system. And yeah, with, with this sort of outlook from the small IoT devices or the, the lower end IoT devices to something much, much bigger, unlike Corestone, I, I would like to thank you. And hopefully you have some ideas on how to put Riot into those um, more recent hardware-based architectures that we provide and uh, hopefully thereby improving uh, the security of IoT deployments. I have a question, Hannes. Yeah. Um, do, do you think that in some of the um, processors with you know these different um, M-class cores and things like this, do you think it's an interesting thing to wind up running multiple instances of Riot that do different things in those cores? Or do you think that this is really, a, uh, it should be a Riot with multiple CPUs underneath it as opposed to uh, multiple CPUs full of Riot? That's a good question. Um... It's almost, uh, yeah, it's, it's almost a question you need to ask to the Riot folks in the room, to be honest. Uh, um, I think for me, I, I would like to see uh, Riot to use some of the more advanced security concept on how that would actually work in practice. I'm not sure because I, I am, I'm probably less familiar with the, the low level, uh, sort of implementation of riot so that that makes it difficult for me to to answer that question questions from the room yeah i also see a question on the on the chat uh are these security features documented and accessible without nda yeah they are actually um uh they are here or right, some examples like there's obviously a lot of documentation depending on how deep you want to go um but uh there are different versions of core stone in the meanwhile. Um, of course, the software is available as open source. There's also details about the, the, the profiles and the document is obviously not short, uh, the architecture specification. Um, and here's here are more details on, as I mentioned on this point authentication. I hope Christian that helps. Anybody else from the room? um the trust zone is 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 this a separate processor or is this uh just something where the uh, processor processes and just shuts the other access to the other parts off yeah good good question uh yeah it's it's not a separate processor it's uh it's a separate um it is uh so the processor can only run in one of the two modes. So it's not two processors running concurrently. Okay. Um, um, and it's actually, this is the same for the A-class world as well. So uh, in, a, in, a, in a mobile phone, if you, which, which also has trust zone, um, it, it would also switch back and forth between the normal world and the secure world. Um, there, the switching of 
forwards and backwards takes a little bit longer uh, because it has a, a different architecture with this, with this secure monitor and blah, blah, blah. But um, so this has been optimized for the embedded world. So it's uh, that transition uh, still takes a little bit of time because uh, state needs to be saved and then on the, on the reverse direction restored and, and um, information in registers need to be wiped out uh, so you don't leak information. But it's um, it's kind of a separate uh, a separate state in the processor. Okay. It's untergenommen. Uh, for features like pointer authentication, uh, is that something that will just be done by the compiler, or do we need to add some support there to um, yeah make it work? Um. Yeah, so there's definitely uh, combined. So typically, uh, what you want to do is, is um, as a developer, you you want to have the compiler insert. Um, let me jump over. You want the compiler to insert those instructions. Um, whether those should be added to each uh, function or not is obviously something that um, a developer needs to decide. So it. Uh, there are typically some extensions, for example, C language extensions uh, that indicate on what functions you would like to uh, to protect in that case. Um, so so it, there are some, um, for, for this specifically, you don't need to, you don't need to as a developer do much besides using the, the latest compiler features uh, and then having at least um, some indication as a for the functions on what you want uh, the compiler to do. Um, when it comes to uh, to things like um, privileged execute never or um, uh, yeah specific or stack limit checking etc., you need to uh, configure the the memory protection unit, which is then that requires you to. Uh, sort of know how you want to fragment or how you want to configure your or use your whole memory space uh, because you have these uh, the number of MPUs available, the regions available, and you need to um, put the memory that you want or the, the data that you, you want to protect or the code into the right place. Um, because if you make the if you configure these regions incorrectly and the wrong permissions, then obviously you will have uh, a lot of issues because you will run into faults and you may not know what's going on uh, because just nothing works anymore. Um, that's why my colleagues have also developed tools to, to help uh, configure the memory regions. Um, but uh, I don't know if those tools have uh, ever made it to Riot or whether there are separate tools for Riot or whether MPUs are not used at all at Riot. I don't know. I, maybe someone in the room can tell. Yeah, thank you. I think I think we have some very basic MPU support currently, but I'm also not not so sure. Yeah, the the MPU um, like on on A class processors when you think about Linux uh, and Trust Zone on 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 those systems, you have a very sophisticated way of isolating code. And programs, uh, and and that obviously provides a lot of value, because um, an application cannot easily write into, let's say, a kernel, or it cannot easily um, write into the hypervisor, etc. And in on an IoT device, so if you don't use Trust Zone or memory uh, memory protection unit, there's essentially no isolation whatsoever. <laughs> And so even a, a small bug in the program can easily overwrite security features and everything, right? It's kind of more the MS-DOS days. So, so it's probably worthwhile to think about how, how memory isolation is provided specifically if you think of uh, um, the more and more complicated uh, devices with lots of protocols that we are using from like regular UDP co-op, all the, all the protocols uh, there's always a chance to have bugs in there. And so isolating the code obviously makes a lot of sense. 
And <clears throat> thanks, Hannes, for this uh, nice overview and for the, the links for the documentation. Um, I know of, uh, of a few people in this uh, crowd who've been uh, attempting to take this uh, this uh, secure uh, versus unsecure modes uh, uh, of operation. And uh, so far, as far as I know, they 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 they, uh, they didn't succeed. <laughs> um, actually, I, I don't think they they could even um, uh, you know understand if they were actually launching and from the secure mode or secure mode really basic stuff. Um, and so um, hopefully we can uh, use this uh, documentation to, to um, decipher a little bit where, where, where we are. Um, <clears throat> one question I had like is uh, some problems uh, they run into as far as I remember is, is uh, uh, some stuff was pretty specified uh, or the documentation out there uh, Mm, uh, it was like vendor depend on like some of the part of the implementation, and so do, do you recommend a specific board or uh, where where you know like all the docs out there and all the all the all the, the specs are like it's pretty clear and there is actually open source code that that kind of shows like uh, register manipulation and switching from one mode to the other thing like that because that would be extremely valuable uh, I guess for for us but also for for uh, others and uh, yeah, that's what we've been, we've been struggling a little bit like over the last uh, last last few times. Uh, there's been some attempts, as far as I know. So if you have any recommendations on on the actual hardware, where yeah, that that would be also interesting. Yeah, um, I, I don't. I wouldn't want to point to a single sort of vendor and say he, they do it better than others uh, for obvious reasons. But um, but what I would do is. Um, I would basically uh, look at the trusted firmware code and, and that has been by the vendors has been, um, or it has in it, the work is done in, in a trusted firmware.org, uh, it's a Lenaro uh, project and vendors have come and used that reference code and then uh, made it work on their hardware as they launch new uh, boards. And that's an easy way to see how they have done it. Um, you may not, you may change things, but you at least have a working solution uh, to begin with, right? And so um, I would use that as a stepping stone. What you can also do is instead of um, buying the hardware uh, right away, a development board, uh, is to use one of the um, sort of like the uh, what we call fast models or uh, fixed virtual platforms, which is a virtualization environment. So we have recently, um, a few months ago, launched um, ARM virtual hardware as a way to essentially run the latest hardware uh, in emulation in the cloud. Uh, so you can try things out and see what it works uh, without a lot of uh, hassle, even for older versions of, of the hardware, like regular trust zone for VM. That's something you can even run in QEMU. Um, so so that's, um, I think that could be also a good way to, to see how things work. That's what I would do. Um, also, like if you try something more sophisticated, like a system like this, clearly more sophisticated, um, uh, there, uh, we also offer this type of uh, setup in uh, as part of ARM virtual uh, hardware. And I can, I can send the link around. Uh, that may be a, a good way to get to see how this works. It's actually um, it it nicely relates to a talk. I think was it last year or the year before at the riot summit when someone was talking about uh, the SDM 32 MP1 uh, board, which also had a, a mix of Cortex A and Cortex M. Um, unlike the SDM board, which started the A class first uh, and then started the M class. Uh, this one works the other way around. Uh, so this secure enclave is responsible for kicking off the rest of the system. And so you can do that in a, in sort of an emulation environment. Um, and that's, that could be uh, very convenient to just see how things work, step through the code and uh, without any, without any hassle, just use the existing code and, and learn from the, from the code, how it works. Thanks.
And if anyone has any questions, like obviously there's a lot of details hidden in here, uh, just drop me a note and um, I'll try to find the right people or the right documents for you. Uh, yes, uh, thanks of all. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks for your talk. It was certainly uh, very interesting. Uh, I have one more. I think it's more of a comment than a question. So Riot also supports platforms which are not ARM-based, of course. And uh, for this reason, if we want to employ many of the hardware security features that you mentioned, we have to do so in a way that it remains optional. So we can still support Riot on platforms which do not have these security features. Can you maybe comment on if you believe this to be feasible or if this would be a lot of work to make um, employment of such features in Riot um, optional? It will definitely, um, it's a good, it's a, it's a interesting engineering question. Uh, it will definitely require a lot of uh, if devs, right? Um, in, the, in the code to, to get this to work. Uh, un the unfortunate thing with security is that it's really cuts through the whole system uh, in a, in a somewhat uh, complex way. Um, and so like having everything kind of customizable is, is not uh, trivial. So yeah, how would you do that best? Um, like um, maybe, uh, for example, it, uh, the Cepher uh, operating system, Atos, uh, also supports a number of different um, hardware ecosystems and so they also had to face that problem so it might be worthwhile to, to check out how they had approached this uh, this issue and uh, one of the one of the guys um, uh, David Brown who who is the lead maintainer of MCU boot uh, he attended the last IDF meeting and I think the one before uh, so it might be worthwhile to reach out to him he may actually have the right context if he doesn't uh, himself know the answers to that Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Um, yeah. Because after all, we talk about the very complicated software stack here, even not just the software, but also the build process. Uh, like for example, with, with CoreStone, um, we use, uh, and that was also mentioned in another talk uh, yesterday, we use Yocto uh, to build everything. So classical uh, embedded Linux systems are also using Yocto, um, but then you have to, use Yocto and write Yocto recipes to kick off the build process of the, the secure enclave and the expansion system, which is um, kind of unusual. Like if you are M-class developer, uh, embedded developer, you are probably not uh, a Yocto user. Uh, so it's it feels weird, but uh, it's like, on the other hand, it's a one click and then the whole system is built, uh, which is also fantastic. So maybe you can actually, if you if you have such a powerful build system like Yocto, you could potentially use um, the features that Yocto provides to uh, to customize the build process in such a way that it, depending on which target you are building the system for, it basically puts everything together in a way that you you want. It's kind of a, a CMake on steroid, steroids, uh, so that may be a, a worthwhile route to to investigate. Hannes, um, question that relates to this, I think, is is um, do we, in order to be able to build code that runs in, you know, the trust zone, this kind of stuff, I guess we need to have um, a bootloader that actually can can load the right code into the as a trusted executable, and then you need the other things. And does does that require that? Um, we have established um, uh, any kind of syncing process in our build process in our build environment. Is it really just up to our choice and bootloader? At that um, point? Yeah, you you were breaking up a little bit, but um, I think I got the question. Um, so um, you you obviously have to distinguish um, a development system from a sort of a system that has been locked down. So clearly with something that has been locked down already, there's very little you as a developer can, can do uh, intentionally because that's the whole point uh, of locking it down. Um, but if you, if you 
have a system like let's say like one on on arm virtual hardware you can you can then use um for example here mcu bootloader or, or another bootloader if you like uh and then start um and have the code you want and and boot whatever you want and, and do whatever you want uh because you are you, you're taking a, a few shortcuts there um to um bypass the lowest security checks which would otherwise uh sort of lead you to a lockdown system so well, the first are are there are there magic words that we need to say when we order the parts to make sure we're getting a part that hasn't been locked down already because that would be useless to order a lockdown part for a developer right yeah that definitely, definitely. so is there uh, is there magic words we use to say you know we need a, a green machine or a you know, some some kind of uh, we just say we need a development board, or you know, what, how do we know that we're not we not got a lockdown part before it was shipped? Yeah, a development board, uh, yeah. or you talk to someone who um, uh, who already works uh, worked with one of the boards and and knows which one is uh, fits for a given scenario, because yeah. it really depends on what you want to accomplish. Like sometimes the development board is the right choice. Sometimes emulation is the right tool. Sometimes you may need an FPGA. Um, sometimes you even need to simulate. Uh, all of sorts of have, everything has its use. Uh, just uh, the use is different. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions from the room? Well, thank you very much, Hannes, for joining us. Yeah, we have a coffee you. break now. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, for not, uh, I, I didn't manage to make it to Berlin. I, I wish I would be there and uh, have a coffee before you guys. Thank you. Good he didn't go to Berlin. <laughs> <laughs>